I'm going right into my text. It is my custom. Those you sharing with us on television, I'm just so honored by your presence and you greet me in the streets and say how much you enjoy our ministry. And if you do not have a church home, I certainly want to invite you to share Christ with us at your earliest convenience. My text today is coming from the Apostle Paul's epistle to the church at Rome, the 15th chapter, and I began reading from verse 1. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And as I know you're praying for the, each and every message, uh, my subject is the strong must help the weak. The strong must help the weak. Paul was especially teaching the strong that their strength is given to them in order that it may be used to help others. The strong must take seriously their obligation to use their God-given strength in the service of the God who gave it to them to help their weaker brothers and sisters. True greatness lies not in being strong, but true greatness lies in the right use of strength. To you who are spiritually strong, under the sound of my voice or watching on television, I have to ask you this question. Who made you strong? Who did it? And if you did it, then you can give yourself some credit. I used to love the, the green lantern. I went and, and got, got the green. You know, because in reality, anybody could be the Green Lantern if you just got the ring. Ain't like Superman. I mean, Green Lantern, you get the ring, you can go Green Lantern. <laughs> Are y'all with me on this? I want to read to you just a brief excerpt about the Green Lantern, if you don't mind. Green lanterns originate from a distant planet called Oe. On this planet is a race of beings known as the guardians of the universe. A highly intelligent and powerful race, these creatures wanted to help bring order and justice to the universe. To do so, they created an energy source known as the central battery. An energy source, now listen carefully, comprised solely of willpower alone. The Guardians also created a device called a power ring, which could tap into the power of the central battery if the user had sufficient willpower. The wielders of these power rings were to be champions of the universe and were to protect and help those in need. They were known as the Green Lantern Corps. Now, I wanted you to know, for those who saw the film, some of you did, first he couldn't get the, the power thing to come on. And I want you to know, you see this? See, nothing's on. But when you, when you touch the button in the middle, <laughs> the, the light come on. 
What he didn't understand was, see, this ring worked off willpower. You see, he had to be willing, and he had to tap into the central battery. Now, y'all hear me what I'm saying? He had to get this ring tapped into the central battery, and when he got the ring tapped into the central battery, the central battery knew he was willing, the power ring knew he was willing, and then the power ring came on. See, that's y'all problem. Y'all ain't tapped into the power source. See, God is the power source. And the scriptures say, whoever is willing, let him come. You know, it's sad when you do not qualify as a whoever or whosoever. Because whosoever will, let him come. So the whole issue about salvation it has nothing to do with a person's works has nothing to do with how intelligent or bright they are. It has everything to do with whether they are willing to use the power. To use the power, they have to humble themselves and go before God where the power source is. How many of you know about that power? Because with this power, the Scriptures say, you shall receive power after that. The Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria unto the uttermost parts of the earth. See, we didn't get a power ring because most of y'all would lose it. You would, where that power ring is? To, but see, God gave you the spirit. When you opened up your heart and repented of your sins and were baptized in his name, when you asked God to simply forgive you your sins, when you acknowledge you were a sinner and that sinners are not going to go to heaven, when you say, Lord, I'm a sin I can still see the day that I got electrified. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says that they that know their God shall be strong. Without the ring, Green, Latin, ordinary. Without the Holy Spirit, you've got nothing. Without the Holy Spirit, you'll be back cussing, drinking, running the street, doing everything, because you barely keep yourself straight with the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, without strong spirituality in the church and family, the foundation and structure of our, of our society begins to collapse under stressors and strife and crises. This is a hard world to live in. Brothers and sisters, we got to thank God that he has sent some people into your families and your home who are so connected to God that they have a strength that the rest don't have. The rest may think it's the person. That's because the Bible says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. So they are foolishness unto them, and they can't know them because they're spiritually discerned. So because this is spiritual, it's like trying to explain to somebody who go to Jupiter what Jupiter is like, and they come back, they can't explain it because that person they're talking to has never experienced it. So when you're trying to explain what it means to have power on the inside, when you try to explain what it means to have the Holy Spirit, the only way to know what the Holy Spirit is like is to get the Holy Spirit. The only way to know what coffee tastes like is to drink some coffee. The Bible says in Proverbs 24 and 10, the weak faint in the day of adversity because their strength is small. If you faint and falter in times of trouble, it's because God himself is not residing in you and life is overpowering you. Their strength is small because they're not in a firm, secure relationship with God. Note what Psalm 68 verses 34 and 35 have to say on this matter. Proclaim the power of God whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the skies. You are awesome, O oh God. In your sanctuary, the God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be the God who gives power. We, Bonnie, call this 
Power Sunday. This, when God's power is in your life, there is nothing you cannot handle because it is God at work in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I feel some anointing coming in this house. And to you who are spiritually strong, the one that everyone depends on, it's not just about you. It's about how your strength can be a blessing to others in the family and in the community and in society. God don't make you strong for you just to brag that you're strong. God gives you strength so you can be a blessing in the life of somebody who is weak and powerless. Oh, I feel the Lord helping me. That's the lesson Joseph, the son of Israel, had to learn. A strong young man. And some of you are young, you teenagers. I love it when God sends our young men and women down to get baptized at a young age. Because sometimes we get to a certain age and we just don't change. We see life in one way, in one prism, and that's it. But when a child is young, and this is why I tell you parents all the time, while your children are young, bring your children to church. Let your children hear the gospel story. So they can know who Jesus is and his power and might while they're children. Now, don't send them to church and you don't live it out. Because then you make your child schizophrenic. <laughs> because you're telling them about the love of God and what God can do. But when they get home, nothing connects it. And that's how you end up in other faiths or not in religion at all. Because it's not working for them. So, parents, you have a huge responsibility to live out your profession. This Joseph, a visionary at 17. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 to 11. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. So here's a problem right away. Stop playing favorites with your kids. Because he had been born to him in his old age. He made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not, what, speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brother, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were buying the sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. <laughs> we're going to buy down the baby brother? His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. He told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. This time, the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brother, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. One thing we should be clear of from this story, don't tell everybody your dream. <laughs> Some people jealous. Now, no, Joseph, is he's messed up. I agree. The boy is 17. How many 17-year-olds you know got their head on straight? How many of you had your head on straight at 17? I just told somebody recently, I said, I don't know if I would have been able to be saved at 17. I had the same problem all the other boys had at 17. <laughs> oh, it's fixable, but it's a lot easier when you get saved at 27 and got a wife and kids. Joseph sees personal greatness. Joseph sees himself superior to his siblings, even to his father and mother. No wonder his siblings were jealous and envious of him. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I'm helping someone now and even on television. That's why the strong must go down before they go up. Yes, Joseph, you got the roll, the ring, if you please. But you are arrogant. You are proud. You are selfish. Most of you know the story. His brothers wanted to kill Joseph. And verse number 19 of chapter 37 says, here comes that dreamer. They said to each other, come now, let's kill him, throw him into one of these cisterns, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. 
Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. Ladies and gentlemen, where are we in our family life when brothers and sisters have the ability to kill one another? Their own flesh, their own blood. Where are we? The first murder in the Bible is fratricide. Cain is jealous of Abel. And many of your families are so bad that you can't even have an annual family reunion without somebody getting shot. So much hatred and evil among flesh and blood. Instead of killing him, they throw Joseph into a pit. The dreamer, the visionary is in a pit. Surely this was not a part of his dream. I'm speaking to you visionaries in the house. Most of you think you're a visionary, but you're really a dreamer. Say, so what's the difference? The visionary achieves what he dreams. From here on, God begins to test and shape the character of Joseph. You see, trouble is what gives a person a chance to discover their strength or lack of it. In Romans chapter 5, I want to read verses 3 through 5. Paul says, not only do we rejoice in our sufferings, because we know, let the church say, we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us. It doesn't make us ashamed. Why? Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Let the church say amen. amen. As I said before, God sends his strong people down before they go up. The pit is dirty, filthy, and bugs. Humiliation is essential to becoming humble. No one achieves anything in this world without suffering humiliation and hurt and pain and many times from the people who are closer to them than anybody else. The Bible says in Hebrews 5 and 8, Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So when God is sending you through your test and trial, God's got a plan. He's, he's not a sadist. He's not trying to make you miserable. God is shaping you. God is molding you. God is putting in you strength of character. And the only way to get it is through tests and trial and temptations. And ladies and gentlemen, the real test of your vision is when they get thrown into the pit. At some point, ladies and gentlemen, when you have your vision and you just walking along life's road, minding your own business, <laughs> thinking that you're going forward, thinking that everything is all right, and maybe you're just going to be going higher and higher in God, the next thing you know, ladies and gentlemen, Something happens. At some point in everybody's life, <laughs> at some point in everybody's life, life knocks you down. <laughs> and sometimes you are blindsided like Joseph and this fella over here. <laughs> Try to help a brother out. <laughs> Down. Down, ladies and gentlemen, is the place of broken relationships. Down is the place of moral failure. Down is it the place of your finances being shot. Down is the place 
where somebody has crushed you and devoured you and you are now in despair. Down is the place that you look at and you wonder how in the world did you get down when life seemed to be going okay. So a loved one, you get a call in the middle of the night and a loved one that was here that morning is gone. That's down. Down the place where you can't pay your bills. Down the place where you're single and lonely and can't seem to find nobody, no matter how cute you are. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, the problem with being down, you can develop a woe is me attitude. You can start feeling sorry for yourself. You can just feel like everybody in the world is turned against me. Brothers and sisters, tell me, let me hear you say, you got to watch being down. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you see our down brother here. If you stay down too long, you become bitter and hateful and resentful. Some of the worst saints to deal with are bitter saints. People feel life has been unfair to them. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to be clear. Life is unfair to all of us in one way or another. If you want to talk about something being fair, that's called heaven. Life is unfair. Everyone's not brought up in a nuclear family. Some, every, a lot of people were brought up without their father, without their mother. A lot of people had poverty. A lot of people were brought up in the ghetto. A lot of people had everything working against them. The question is, do you stay down? Hear me carefully. When you're down, you can reach a place in your life that even as people reach out to help you, you reject them. They trying to pull you up, and you and you won't even you. As a matter of fact, you start trying to pull them down with you. Now see, now when they start trying to pull you down, that's when you draw the line. Reminded of a song goes like this by Bobby Womack called his friend Harry Hippie. He said, I like to help a man when he's down, but how can I help him when he's laying on the ground? And let me say something to the brother on the ground. You might as well get up on your knees. Because see, while you're down, you ought to get up on your knees. Well, why should you get up on your knees? Because while you're down and on your knees, you can pray to the God who can get you up. Come on and magnify the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a place that we've been in. Can I get some help out here? But here's what I want you to understand in life. Life may knock you down, but you have to choose to get up. That's a conscious choice that you make that separates the winners from the losers. The winners and the losers had the same stuff happen, but the loser stays down and the winner gets up. You see, and I'm talking to them, where are my Holy Ghost filled people out here? Now, now note this. This ball is laying here down. You see that object right there down? It's laying right there next to the down brother. Who's supposed to have the Holy Ghost? I think. But what I want you to understand, this object is called a ball, and it was manufactured not to stay down. It was manufactured so that when it go down, it come back up. That's the way it was made. It was not made to stay down because they wouldn't have put something in it to make it get up again. God put something down in you. That God wants you not to stay down, but God wants you to get up. And not only does God want you to get up, God wants you to soar like the eagle. Good catch. And let me say this, when your spirit is right, when your attitude is right, now when the person comes alone to help you, when the strong person comes to help you, you get rid of your pride. You get rid of your arrogance. And when that person reaches out their helping hand, you get up 
and you go on to see what the end is going to be. Give God the praise. Mm -mm -mm. I feel like soaring. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, you who are strong, you got to reach out your hand to help people get up. You reach out with the hand of forgiveness. You reach out with the hand of financial resources. You reach out with the hand of advice. You reach out with the hand of wisdom. You reach out and help your weaker brother and sister. Why? Because the strong must help the weak. We hope that you have been blessed by this broadcast. And we look forward to you worshiping with us on Sunday mornings at our 1015 a.m. service. Also, we invite you to join us for our Tuesday night Bible study at 7.30 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. Please visit us online at www.VictoryApostolicChurch.org. If this particular sermon blessed you and you would like to order the full broadcast worship service, please send a check or money order to Victory Apostolic Church. We would gladly accept your credit card purchase Monday through Friday between the hours of 9 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Please include the broadcast title and number along with your selected choice of media, CD or DVD, 